welcome Shelly Yates. Thank you very much. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I love a full house. I don't have to talk twice. <laughs> um, I've been traveling since April 15th. Next week I get to go to California and meet uh, Reverend Michael Beckwith in California. So I'm very excited because we've been looking for the kind of the little polls that we can get a little bit of media and have the, the last month really kind of oomph. So I think that's going to happen. And as I started to travel, uh, I discovered a kind of a format to tell you my story. Everything I tell you has been downloaded. I haven't read any books, so I, if somebody says, oh, did you read this book? I didn't. Everything I tell you is what I've heard from the other side. So where I start my talk is a brief little discussion about where I was, who I was, who Shelley Yates was. And I was a very unhappy little girl. My sexual abuse started at age five and it went on for a very, very long time. I was what I called a Prozac princess because I was either on Prozac or lithium or something trying to just stay on the planet. I was so unhappy, I was suicidal every day in my life. I would plan elaborate suicides and then say, oh, I can't do it today, I'll have to wait till tomorrow. So I'm very blessed that tomorrow never seemed to come and I never tried and I'm here to tell this story to you. And the biggest miracle I share with you tonight is that as individual human beings, we have choice to step out of our misery. We have choice to step out of despair and depression and walk into joy. And I've done that without any drugs. I'm now drug free. I've been drug free for five years. I was told I would never be. So that to me is my greatest joy and blessing that I get to share with you. But there's a whole bunch of miracles along the way. On November, no, November 14th, 2002, my four-year-old son and I were going to a friend's house. Uh, I was going to a friend's house to go and complain about my life. That's what I was doing. And I did it three times a week. It was my buffer zone. So I had my son in the front seat with me and we were headed up an abandoned road in Nova Scotia. And as I went up this little abandoned road, I saw on the left hand side a large lake that had flooded. We had had rain for three full days. The lake had flooded. The water was rushing across the, lake, uh, the road into a small marshy pond. So I slowed down to 20 because I didn't want a hydroplane and as I entered the little river running across the road, my tires lifted up and pulled towards the guardrail and I went, oh shit, now I'm going to beat up my car. I was on welfare, I was in university trying to put myself through school with two small kids, I couldn't afford to repair the car, that's all I could think about. As I moved towards the guardrail, the guardrail was buried into the ground and my passenger side tires went up on the guardrail and I kind of roller coastered into the center of this lake. Now logic states I should have rolled over on my side or hooked up in the guardrail, which bummed me out even more because it was going to cost more money to get a tow truck. <laughs> but that's not what happened either. As I moved into the center of this little body of water, my car without any motivation <laughs> flipped over the guardrail out into the lake 10 feet and landed on the roof. So I looked at my son and I said, are you okay? And he said, yes, mommy. I said, well, mommy's going to put down the window and we're going to crawl out. Because I thought I'd landed on a bog. I'm from Newfoundland. We know what bogs are. So I thought it was a marshy bog and I was very happy because it didn't crunch the roof of the car. So I put my finger on the window and as I did, the water started to rush into the car. The window only opened this far. And I realized that my bog was a flooded marsh and the car started to sink very, very quickly to the bottom. Now I wasn't panicked because I was a lifeguard and a scuba diver. I had my nationals. I had every, everything you could think of to do with lifeguarding and survival in water. So I looked at my son and I said, okay, this is a lake and we have got to get out of this lake. So when I tell you, you take a deep breath and mommy's going to open the door and we're going to swim out of the car. And he looked at me with that little boy, mommy can do anything, look. <laughs> So I grabbed him by his coat and I gripped tightly to hold his coat and I put my other hand on the door handle and I waited and as the water came up over me and it was cold and as it came up over and came up over I got to the point that we had to breathe and I said okay take a breath now baby and the two of us took our breath and the water came up over our heads very quickly. I pulled the door handle, the door wouldn't budge. I leaned over, I pulled his door handle, it wouldn't budge. I started a little frantic, pulling on doors and pushing on windows. Nothing was moving. 
I needed both of my hands. So I took my son's body and I lifted him out of his chair and I pushed him into the back seat over my head, hoping if there was anywhere in the car that there was air, it might be in the back. But when I looked back, that car was upside down and if there was air, it was in the trunk. So I pushed him away from me and I began in earnest life saving. I'm pushing on doors and I'm pushing buttons and I'm pulling on things and I put my feet against windows. Nothing's budging and I had to breathe. So as I took in my breath, the water rushed into my lungs like liquid fire. And I lost my cool. My, my ability to life save went out the window because I didn't mind dying. But my baby was drinking in fire water too. And I went into pure panic because I knew I was going to die. I could not get out of this car. And I knew I was going to die, so I wanted my son's body back. I wanted him to hold him because in his dying moments I had pushed him away. What was he going to think? So I started frantically searching the car for a coat tail or a shoe or something I could grab and pull back so I could die with my baby in my arms. I couldn't find anything. And the more frantic I got, I had to breathe. And just before I took the next breath, I heard in my ear, as loud as my voice to you today, relax, relax. And it was booming and majestic and commanding. Well, I didn't take commands from anybody. So this made no sense. I thought this was dying. I thought well, I was, you know, hallucinating. Relax. And then almost as if the voice knew who Shelley was, it stopped commanding me and it started to lull me. You're okay. You need to calm down. You're going to be okay. They're coming to help you. Well, I was on a kind of an abandoned road. There was not much road traffic there. And I said, Nobody's coming to help me. But all this happened. I wasn't looking for my son. I wasn't worrying about breathing. A, a time seemed to stop. All of a sudden, in through my chest came the knowledge of drowning. If I continued to fight the water, my lungs would fill up with water. And if they filled up with water, the guy doing CPR couldn't bring me back. So you need to relax. You need to give yourself over to the water and allow yourself to pass. I didn't need much prompting. I was tired and cold. I was suicidal anyway, and I said, give yourself over to absolute pleasure. And I put my arms out, my head back, and I died. That sentence is a sentence from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> Blows my mind, but that's what it was. So I died. My flesh and bones stayed in that car, but who Shelley is, the essence of who I am, went off out into the sky, and it was a majestic blue sky with little wisps of white cloud. And as I went up there, I found myself contained in a room. And the room was rectangular shape with glass walls, but I couldn't see the glass walls. I just knew they were there. And if I was looking at the room this way, in the center of the room was a table, four feet by four feet by four inches, with a large pedestal base. And down the left-hand side of that table were three large beans in monk robes, heavy robes coming up over their heads, heavy big hooped armholes that they were holding themselves like this. They had their head bowed. I knew the rules of the game. I knew what was happening. The first guy had taken a row, the second guy had taken a row, and now it was this third one on the corner. This long willowy hand came out of the robe and it looked like it had long fingers, but it looked like mercury in a tube. And it, and it picked up a die. Now when I looked down at the table, there was a relief map etched into the, into the table. And it was the continents before they split. And I learned, I learned that that was the Pangaea, but I could also see Lemuria and Atlantis. I was like, wow. So as this bean had the die in its hand, it tossed it across the table and the die rolled and it stopped and the bean was pissed off. I didn't, it didn't hear anything, but you just knew the feeling of I didn't get what I wanted feeling. And out of the robe came the big long hand again and it went ping and my car flew over the guardrail and out into the lake because the Pangaea had shifted and it was me driving up the road. I could see Rocky Lake Road, I could see the trees and the little, the little lakes and I went, oh my God, he pinged me into the lake. No wonder I flew over 10 feet out into the lake when I was doing 20. He pinged me. So I'm like, oh my God, we're a petri dish. This was my feeling that humanity was a petri dish and these beings were sprinkling sand. Oh, look at them run. And I'm going, this sucks. But down the right-hand side were three more beings. 
They were the same size, six or seven feet, no, seven or eight feet tall, large hooded cloaks, and the hood, their arms in these big um, sleeves. Now the ones on the left had been a gray color, and the ones on the white, on the right, were whitish, but not white white. And they told me, don't judge us, we're both essential, we are the balance of your existence. And then I understood this was all symbolic. Everything I was seeing was symbolic to teach me what was going on. So the three down the right hand side said, twist of fate, twist of fate, twist of fate, only on the corners are we allowed to intervene. It was a rule. So the three of them, without rolling the die or anything, went tru, 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 and they put stuff on the board. They said, we have put everything in place for you to save yourself and your son. Now is the time, child, to have faith. Well, I didn't have any faith. I didn't have any God. I didn't have anything. I used to say I had the power of one, all right, and you're looking at her. <laughs> I was one tough cookie. So these beings had put something on the table and said, we are going to give you the instructions to save yourself and your son. Follow the instructions implicitly and have faith, child. We are here. We love you. Ping, I was gone. I was coming back into my body. Now the whole time I was up in the sky, three things happened that saved my life. Remember they put three things down. Three things happened. There was a man driving north on that abandoned road and a man driving south. They were friends and business partners and they were on cell phones to each other at that moment. And as they drove by each other, the first guy said to the second guy, did you see that car in the lake? And the other guy said, it wasn't there when I drove by. So the three minutes that it took them to drive by, I went in the lake. They turned around and came back to the spot and jumped out of the car. Two of them said, I guess we're going swimming. <laughs> and they said to the third guy, but you're not, because he was my second miracle. He was the second thing placed on the board. He was a nine-year veteran paramedic. And he was driving one of those cars. So the two guys went into the lake and they started going up and down trying to find is there somebody in the car. So they reached in the open window and they said yes there's somebody in the car, they could feel me. And they went around the car and around the car pulling door handles, they couldn't get anything open. Fifteen full minutes. Four minutes to get back to the site, fifteen full minutes to get that car door open. As a matter of fact the last time they came up they said we can't get anything open, we can't get her out. And at that point, the man said, I'm going to give it one more try. He went down, and his foot, I had a flat handle um, opener, his foot hooked, and as he lifted his knee, the door popped open. He went back down. He'd been in the water for 15 minutes. He said he was so cold, he couldn't squeeze his hands together. So he didn't know how he was going to pull me out. So what he did was put his hand in with open fingers and weave my hair back and forth, every bit of hair he could get. And then he said he was so tired he couldn't pull. So he threw his body back against himself this way. And after three or four big heaves against his own body, I popped out. He pushed me over to the man that was hanging from a tree and hanging out into the lake because I was ten feet out. He grabs me. I rolled over. He said, your face was full of moss, your eyeballs, your ears. You were black and blue. And he was screaming to the paramedic. Get the dead chick out of my arms. This is gross, gross, gross. <laughs> I've, I've grown to know and love these men very deeply. <laughs> but he knew how gross this was. So he pushes me, the paramedic hauls me over the guardrail and drops me. Starts CPR. Seven full minutes he pushed on my chest. Seven full minutes. 260 pound man. He looked over his shoulder and he said to the guys on the other side, she's gone. She's dead. And with that, I sat straight up in the middle of the road and said, get my baby out of the lake. <laughs> he rolled over backwards, there's a kid in the lake. And a bunch of people went back in the water because the other two people by now had hyperthermia and they couldn't do anything. A crowd of people had gathered. They went in the lake. They started searching for my son's body, it, literally in the car, and they couldn't find his body. So anyway, they get out and they say, we can't find him, we can't find him. And this woman by the side of the road is going, there's a man right there at the top of the hill because this was a quarry. And there was a little tiny road, probably two lengths of this room. And she said, he's up at the top of the hill there with a boom truck. So somebody ran up and it took him 30 seconds to drive that boom truck down the hill because he was sitting in it having a coffee break. 
Third miracle of the day. Wow, boom, 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 three things. He comes down the hill, two or three more people jump in that lake and they take the grappling hook, they hook it to the axle of the car and they pull the car up into the, up into the sky, 15 feet. And I can see my son's body floating in the back window. He's been in the lake for 30 minutes or more. They're saying, we've got him, he's fine. And I'm crying and screaming, he's not fine, he's dead. He's been in the lake for 30 minutes. I'm, I'm trying to get up and I'm pushing. It took four men to hold me down that day. You know the whole mother's love and so powerful? I had bruises from being held down. By that time, the ambulance has, has showed up. They opened the car door and as the water flowed out of the car, my son's body floated out. <coughs> And a man caught him. And they said, we've got him, he's fine. I knew he wasn't fine, but by now it was too late. And they were putting me in an ambulance. And they were taking me to the adult hospital, which was one other place. And they put him in an ambulance and took him to his hospital, which was somewhere else. So we went different directions. And the whole way I'm crying, give me morphine, give me morphine. I just want to be zoned out. I, want, I killed my son. I killed my son. I get to the hospital and it keeps going. I want drugs. I want drugs. I don't want to be here. And the doctors are saying, okay, and they're getting ready to give me a shot, but my boyfriend is there saying, no, 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 no drugs till we find out about Evan. And the doctor said, we've already found out about him. Your son is dead, and we can't lose you too. My blood pressure was 250 over 195. They had the crash cart ready. My core temperature was down to, you know, you shouldn't be here. And the doctor said, if you put your feet on the floor, you're going to have a heart attack and die, so don't move. My friends were all there crying and, and like, what are we going to do? And my other girlfriend, who's a real doer, gets in the car and drives to the other hospital and comes back and she says, get your ass out of that bed. Your son needs you. He's alive and he's over there. Oh, man. The doctor said, don't move. Don't move. You'll have a heart attack. I'm serious. And I said, what do I got to do for you to let me go? How do I get out of this hospital? And he said, if you bring your vitals back to normal, we'll let you go. Of course, he didn't think for a second I could do that. <laughs> and in the half an hour I was 120 over 70, core temperature back up and I stood there stark naked. <laughs> I said, you better get me some clothes or I'm going naked. <laughs> the woman came in with a, a tracksuit, three sizes too small. I looked like a sausage with my paper slippers. <laughs> my boy's alive, I'm going to the hospital. I'm excited. I get to the hospital, my boy's not alive. He's hanging by a thread. I go into the room, it's a blacked out room, and there's these two blue little lights glowing. He has tubes in every hole you can put a hole for a human being. He's bleeding out of his ears, he's bleeding out of all these tubes. He has a, a whole crown of wires going into his head, and there's three large video screens, all flatlined. And the doctor says, your son's in bad shape. And I said, this is not my son. This is an X-Files experiment. And they said, no, your son is, is dying. So they, they took me out of the room, and they took me down to a little hallway cubby room. And three neurologists are standing there saying, OK, here's the deal. Your son's brain dead. He's hemorrhaged into every major organ of his body. What isn't filled with blood is filled with water. So even if he wakes up, even if he opens his eyes, your son will be on every single machine you see here for the rest of his life. And he's brain dead. He will never know you. He will never speak to you again. Now, we suggest you unplug your son just in case he wakes up. Because if he wakes up, then you can't do anything about it. Canada has no euthanasia laws. But we can do it right now. That didn't make any sense to me. I was alive. So I said, I need a minute. And I went down the hallway. And I'm standing there in the hallway. Now, remember, I have no God. I don't really have close relationships with people. And I'm standing there by myself saying, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And in my ear, the same way as in the lake, came, fill it up. Fill it up. Well, I was wide awake and the lights were on and I wasn't having any panic. So this wasn't a hallucination. And on top of it not being a hallucination, in through my chest came the remembering of where I had gone, and these beings saying, we're going to help you and your son follow the instructions implicitly. So I called out, what do you want me to fill up? And right in front of me, the same way I see you, as clear as that, was a bucket. And it was floating there. It was an 1800s water bucket with grooves and cracks. It had been used a lot. This was an old bucket. And as I leaned into the bucket and looked in, there was a little blob of silvery fluid. 
So I lifted my head up and I said, what do you want me to put in the bucket? And as the doctors and nurses and, and patients, parents were moving about the hospital, I saw around their bodies a field of light. And it had kind of a spongy look to it. And it was different colors for everybody that was walking around. Now I'd seen movies, so I understood. I said, that's aura. That's, that's energy. And I heard, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> <laughs> we had communication. And I remember thinking, a bit Bob Barker, but hey. I can do this. I've always been this corny person. <laughs> but anyway, I'm happy. I've got communication. So I said, you want me to get the aura energy out of these people and into the bucket? And I heard, ding, 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 ding. Okay, how do I do it? How do I get it out of people? And then through my chest, sorry. <laughs> through my chest came all the instructions. First off, they told me, you're not what you appear to be. You're not a human being. I was like, Really? Yes, you're an energy being that's taken on this form to be on this planet. So you have to heal both beings. The doctors are working on your son. Let them do what they're doing. We're going to tell you how to rebuild his energy field, his essence. I was like, okay, tell me how to do it. The instructions were to take both hands. It would be a negative and positive polarity. Put them on my son's body and that the energy from us would flow through him like a blood transfusion. Don't do this for longer than 20 minutes at a time because the giver would become depleted. After you gave your gift of energy, then you took your hands off my son and you gave him the gift of human joy. I asked them how many people and they said as many as you can get here. So I called everybody in my little list. People I'd only dated a few times. <laughs> Can you come to the hospital for an energy transfer, you know? <laughs> they came. And not only did they came, they came with their friends. And their friends. So the hospital, any time of the day, had 40 people in the hallways and around these little rooms that we had uh, been gathering in. The other rules were absolutely no negative energy in that room. Nobody is to cry. Nobody is to be upset. Nobody is to go in there and say, oh, poor baby. How are you today, Evan? Everything's great. Come on, wake up. We've got stuff to do. <laughs> We're going on a train. We're going to Disney World. There's a puppy coming. Come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> and that's what we did. The other thing was, it was explained to me that the vibration of music lifted us out of the field of that dense, dark place that we live in into the hard zone of creation. And what we had to do was play music. And my son's favorite music was rock and roll, Aerosmith and Bon Jovi. And we were in the hospital room in ICU of a major hospital in Canada playing Bon Jovi and Aerosmith. Rock and roll in ICU. That was a miracle that they let me do this. Normally you get 20 minutes and you have to be a parent. I had 72 hours of people running through his room playing rock and roll. I said to the doctors, now here's the deal with you guys. You cannot diagnose, you cannot speak to him as if he's not there. The nurses had to go in and address him. Good morning, young man, we're doing blah, blah, blah. And if you can't do it, I'm going to hire somebody who can. I was on welfare. <laughs> but I told you I was one powerful little cuss in my, in my power of one state. And the doctor said, okay. So everybody did what I wanted. I was like, wow, this is great. The doctors diagnosed and did all their yucky stuff out of the room. We played the rock and roll during the day, and when Evan was in what they called quiet time, we played Mozart. Because I, my girlfriend had come and said Mozart's music had healing energies. Put it on. So for 72 hours, we did not ever leave that child alone. We came in two by two, we played the music, we touched his body, and we spent the time with him for 72 full hours. He got worse and worse and worse. I was out of my mind. How can he be getting worse? By the third day, his bowels were passing out of his body. They had been separating and literally passing into his diaper. And he smelled like rotten meat. And I said to the doctor, what's that smell? And he said, your son is rotting. He doesn't have much time left. Would you please unplug him? I went down the hall to actually think about this because he wasn't getting any better. And what's going on? And all of a sudden, I hear Shelley come. He's awake. And I fly up the hallway, and I go into my, in his room, and he's sitting up in his bed with his eyes like saucers. I said, hey, baby, do you know who I am? And he nodded his head. And the doctor said, oh, your son is brain dead. That's just a reaction. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he 
literally just seen the kid wake up. Now my kid smelled like new baby. Everybody smells a new baby? That's what it smelled like. The burn marks on his chest were gone. That was from the paddles. He had three sets of burns around his heart. They were gone. And every tube was running clear. No blood anywhere. No smell of death. I leaned into my son and I said, is my name Sheila? And he shook his head like, are you crazy? You don't know your own name. <laughs> I said, is my name Joanne? And even more. I said, is my name Shelley? And he nodded his head. And I said to the doctor, our conversation's done. So I spent the next 16 hours or so holding my son, singing songs and watching television and saying, come on, we've got to get better and go up, you know, and go home. And Christmas was just around the corner. Within, within the 16 hours, they sent me to recovery. And as I was headed to recovery, the doctor says again, now your son had a really horrible traumatic experience. He'll never walk, he'll never talk, and he'll never poop again. I mean, he knew his bowels were just shot. And I said, I don't want to talk about it. Within three days of recovery, my son said, Mommy, I have to poop. <laughs> and I walked into the bathroom, and as far as I was concerned, this was done. We were going home. Within three weeks of that, we were home having Christmas. And I was determined not to be weird. Determined. Now, people came up, oh, you must have found God. I said, no. This was energy and extraterrestrials. <laughs> I could not understand where God would fit in this equation because I was an atheist and the God I knew was full of wrath and shame. So people were constantly saying this. One woman when we were in the hospital came in and said, can I pray for your son? And at first off I thought, why don't you just do it? <laughs> you know, why do you have to ask me? But then I said, no, I don't want your prayers. Because see, energy and extraterrestrial, I don't want your prayers. <laughs> and she said, oh, okay. And she walked away really kind of perplexed. And I said, wait a minute, I've changed my mind. And as she came back excited, I said, yeah, you can talk to your God for me. You tell your God he can't have my boy. You tell your God that. And she went, okay. <laughs> so you see where I was coming from. The woman went off and we went home, of course, and now I'm determined not to be weird. I didn't want to talk about any of this. I put my kid in daycare and I got on with my great life of welfare and Prozac. <laughs> I didn't need any God, you know. So, six months pass and I'm driven. I have a beat up old car that's really not worth much because I lost the first one. <laughs> and I'm driven to go to Ontario. So I put my kids in the back seat of this old bucket of bolts and I drive to Ontario. And as I'm coming out of Riviera de Loo and I'm coming up over the mountains, the sun's coming up, it's beautiful. I hear in my ear, hello, dear one. <laughs> my heart swelled out of my body. I felt such incredible bliss and joy, I thought I was going to just fall off the road. And as all this was going on, I pulled myself over into the other lane, tranced out. And coming right for me is a big old transfer truck. So I, I pull back into this lane, I go, oh my God. And the voice says, it's too dangerous to be here right now. Don't go, is all I could say. Do not leave me. The bliss I felt was so wonderful. It was the only time in my life I'd ever felt bliss. And the being says to me, we will come again. We have much to share with you. We have so much to tell you about you, your people, your world. We will come again. And I'm bawling by now because as this source being is pulling out of my car, that blissful feeling turns into the same opposite. It's the saddest moment I've ever had and I'm crying and begging, don't leave me, don't go. And I'm crying and my kids are in the back seat and this being is pulling away saying, we love you. And as he's pulling away, he says, we will come again. So I call out and I say, what's your name? And he says, my name is Aramis and we will come again. And it's like, pip, it's gone. It was like two balls of wet plasticine being pushed together and as they pulled apart, they'd come to that break point, and they go, and they break. That's what it felt like. So I pulled to the side of the road, and I cried like a baby. And my kids got up and said, what's wrong, Mommy? And I said, Mommy's having a moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wide awake, and something's going on. So I get my hiney up to Ontario, and I pick up three books. One's called Saved by the Light by Danny and Brinkley, a man who died. Lightning went through his head and out through his foot. 27 minutes in the morgue. The second book was called Talking to Heaven by James Van Prague. And the third book was a book by Edgar Cayce, who was some sort of prophet. And I'm reading these books, devouring them, going, I've had a near-death experience. That's what's happened to me. 
Now, as weird as that was, I had no other choice but to acknowledge something was happening. So I go back to Nova Scotia, and the same urge to go to Ontario comes to me to get off of Prozac. You cannot stay on Prozac. You must get off this medicine. So I do a cold turkey thing, and I'm like, oh, man, I've got to get off this medicine. And for a solid year, I start to vibrate. My flesh is vibrating, and I can feel my dendrites firing and the electricity running through my body. I don't need my glasses anymore. All my hair falls out, and it grows back like this. It used to be brown and straight. My eye color changed. But the big thing was, everything in my life was amped up. I could hear things and smell things nobody else seemed to be experiencing. And I'm like, what's wrong with me? <laughs> Buzzing. So I go to the doctors, and I go to psychiatrists, and I go to the rabbis, and I go to the priests. Help me, help me, help me, help me. And everybody's like, we don't know what to, help, we don't know what to do to help you. We don't, we, you're the expert. The only person who had ever been underwater a long time like me was eight and a half minutes, and he has brain damage. So I was then the official expert, because I was alive and had my faculties. So nobody knew what was going on. Anyway, my mother begs me to go to a conference in Montreal. And off I go to Montreal. And I start the same thing, can you help me? Does somebody know what's going on? Can you help me? Can you help me? And I speak to everybody. I met Raymond Moody. And I told him my story. And he goes, I said, well, here's a project. And Raymond Moody goes, I'm retiring. <laughs> <laughs> now I said, here's a project because for all that period of time I'm vibrating, every time I get in my bathtub, these beings show up and tell me stuff. And what they've been telling me is, thank you for getting off the Prozac. Now we can talk to you. They said it was an insulated barrier. Now, please, anybody on Prozac, do not rush out and stop taking Prozac. This was an, an, a really rare experience. They're explaining to me about the power of love and the vibratory field of humanity. And they're explaining to me that we're vibrating down here. And they explain that, OK, at the bottom of your chakra system is 1 megahertz. And the top of your chakra system is 1,000 megahertz. Most of humanity is living at 300. That 300 is dense, and it's full of hatred and fear. It's the me, 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 there's not enough. What they want us to do is lift our vibratory field to the field of plenty, to love, which is about 800 megahertz. Now, that's an example, because I don't really know what they are. I think they're just giving me symbolic numbers. So 800 megahertz lights up your own field and lights up the grid around the world. And I'm like, what grid? And they said, well, around the Earth grid is an auric body, like you saw around people. And the auric body of the earth grid is made up of the individual <coughs> auric bodies of humanity. Each person gets one hexagon of space on that auric body. And because we're so dense, we can't fire our own field. We certainly can't be sending earth energy down below and out. Because what we are is conduits of energy between the top grid, the auric body, and earth's own grid, which was in the earth. We were like battery posts, feet to the ground, heads to the heavens, and we were meant to channel energy from the heavens into the earth, and from the earth into the heavens. It was what part of our intended purpose was on the planet. So they've given me this project, and they've told me, what you did for a dying boy with a small group of people, you can do for a dying planet with a large group. One hour of our time can change the course of humanity. And I said, well, that's all well and good, but I'm depressed. <laughs> I didn't want any projects. I didn't even know if I believed my own stuff. I certainly didn't want to be going to people asking them for help. But here I was in Montreal asking people for help. We actually have a wonderful man here, Alfred Weber, who talked to me in Montreal during that time. And I'm like, Wah! <laughs> he had me speak to people then, even against. You know, I was like, oh, man, this is crazy. I can't believe this is happening. But I did it. But I didn't believe my own stuff. Anyway, I asked everybody in Montreal if they could help me, and nobody really could. But I met a man named Dr. Stephen Greer. He was sitting by the stage, and I went up and I said, are you Dr. Greer? He said, yes. I said, you're the extraterrestrial guy? He said, yes. I was like, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so I talked to Dr. Greer, and I told him everything I just told you. And he said, we have to talk. I was like, finally, somebody's going to take the project or tell me what's going on. We went off and talked, and he brought his assistant, Annie. And Annie is the woman who sings on my site. Her stage name is Anna L. But Annie's with Dr. Greer. And I'm telling Dr. Greer all the stuff I'm telling you, and I'm saying, look, I've got a project. You're going to have to do it. Here you go. And he says, I'm a busy man. I don't want your project. 
I said, but I'm depressed. I don't want to do it. <laughs> so Annie says to me, we have to talk. I said, okay. So off we go for a little lunch together. And she says, now she's a Catholic. She's been praying her whole life. And she told me that she'd been talking to angels ever since she was a little girl. Fifteen years ago, she explains, an angel came to her house and said that a woman was coming with a project and that one hour of our time could change the course of humanity and that she was the warrior that would walk with me as I did the project. I looked at her and I said, you're crazier than I am. <laughs> what do you say to that? She said, well, we're going to do the project. I said, no, we're not. I got in my car and went back to Nova Scotia. She called me every day. We're doing the project. I said, no. She called me, no. Finally, I said to my kids, if that crazy woman calls again, hang up. <laughs> but she does get me on the phone this day. And she says, I got a bone to pick with you. I'm angry. And I said, what's wrong with you? And she said, every day you play with your son. Every day you have your boy. Every day you have that little beautiful face to love and kiss. These beings gave you the instructions. You followed them. And your boy's with you. You owe them a debt of gratitude. You owe them to follow the instructions. Well, I responded well to guilt. <laughs> I said, fine, I'll do it. But I, I only have the date and the time, and I don't know anything else. And she said, it'll come. She sends me a CD called Spiritual Beings on a Human Journey. And because I hear in the bathtub, I put myself in the bathtub, and I put the CD on in the bathroom. And I said, if you got something to say, let's hear it. Because they had told me we were spiritual beings on a human journey. So I thought this was a sign. I put the CD on, I'm sitting in the bathtub, and lo and behold, embedded in the tonal resonance, because they only speak in tones. Vibratory tones is all that other worlds use. Embedded in the vibratory tones of this man's music were the instructions for Fire the Grip. What it looked like, how to do it, how to put it on the website, what colors to use. I was blown away. It talked about the three stones. If you open my website, there's three stones with a cap, kind of stonehenge looking. They said these stones, and they gave me the exact dimensions, how to build them, how to put them on the site. They said that these stones were an awakening code for the soul. And even human beings who weren't necessarily spiritual were going to feel a draw, saying, there's some truth in this. I don't know why I feel that, but there's some truth in this. And they said that was because the stones held a wake-up code. And when you saw them, you went, ooh, something's going on here. So I called Annie up and I said, okay, I got all the instructions, but they want me to build a website, and I don't know anything about websites. She said, that's okay. My husband says he's going to do everything for you. Build the site, put it all together. And I said, well, we have a, we have a problem because everything has to be done for free. Everything has to be done for free. They said to me, Jesus Christ brought his message of hope and love to the world for free, and so will you. So I couldn't do anything to make any money. So how were we going to do this? She said, that's okay, we're going to manage. First, Bradfield's going to build the site. Now, Bradfield's the musician who created the music that sent me the tones. And as we do the site together, I discover Bradfield hears the music from the heavens in the shower. <laughs> And he rushes out in his towel and he lays down the tracks of what he's heard in the shower. And then he builds the music around it. So he's this brilliant man who can actually make this happen. I was like, wow, that's cool. He follows the instructions. We do everything. The beings ask me to share Bradfield's music with the world. They ask me to ask him to donate 30 minutes of music for free to the site. And Bradfield says, why does God ask poor people to do stuff for free? <laughs> <laughs> we figure it's the purity of intention. When you do things for free, there's a purity of intention. But he did it. Now these beings told me in the tonal resonance of the music I was listening to had the same resonance for all others that listened to it. And that's why the music was essential on the site. Because not only were the stones going to go, ping, wake up, the music was going to go, and you're going to feel truth. So, three people with no budget have reached eight or nine million people hmm. for free. What can we do with three million in the budget? Hmm. That's what I say. These beings said to me, you've got to stop doing stuff out of obligation. Because everything I did, I did out of obligation. 
I didn't believe my own stuff even though I had seen such incredible miracles. And that's why I always say I honor and respect those following a path without the carrot. Because I had the carrot and I still am struggling with my faith. So they said, we've got to get you out of this depression. You've got to stop thinking that stuff is being done to you. You've got to own your life. You've got to own the responsibility and the pieces that you've played. Now here are some tricks to lift your own field. And once you start doing it, and once you start walking the walk, leading by example, people are going to say, what are you doing? You're different. The first thing they told me to do was random acts of kindness. Somebody shoots out in front of you and cuts you off, the first thing you go is your big rah, rah. Right? That doesn't work. <laughs> Send out love. I'm sending you out love right now. I hope your day improves because you're dangerous right now the way you're driving. Send out love. The coffee girl's a little, you know, so-and-so, and you know, you're wondering if she's spitting in your coffee. <laughs> when she comes back, say something kind. I love your hair. Even though she's being mean to you, I guarantee you it'll change her day. But most of all, it will change your vibratory field. The second thing they said to do was to find your joy, your earthly joy. And it didn't matter what that earthly joy was. Find it. Live it and experience it. And as you did that, you would lift your field if you said thank you. Finding your joy and then saying thank you was a great one for lifting your field. Now these beings showed me my own auric field. And in it were little spirals of liquid light. And they were a golden color. And then they showed me coming out of my solar plexus area, shooting out into the, to the cosmos, was a cord that linked us to the, to the cosmos. And as we did these kindnesses, and as we practiced joy and gratitude, the spirals were sucked into the tube. And the same liquid light in the tube is what these beings are made of. And they said, we are you. We are the light of the light, as are you. You and I are the same. We have already done our time in human form. We're here now to assist you. The third thing they said was to play music of the resonance that you were striving to attain. So Brad would send me every single CD he owned. And for, for six months or a year, or I don't even remember, I played it all the time because they said the vibrations of that kind of music would lift your field. Mozart, they talk about Mozart all the time and how Mozart had the same healing lifts, the same tonal lifts. So Mozart did it, and Bradfield does it, but many other people do it. You will know it when you hear it, because after you've listened to it, you'll feel refreshed and whole and alive. That's the byproduct of lifting your field. So do random acts of kindness, find your human joy and give gratitude, and play music that lifts your field. Because when you fill a room with vibrations, your heart strives for the highest vibration. And right now, the room in this, we're bulging at the seams in this room. And what happens is even people who don't believe, if they're in the space, really start to go, oh, something's going on. So they're saying, you've got to walk the path with intention. You've got to put yourself into this. Well, I still don't really want to do it, but I start to practice. I find my joy, and I step into it, and I'm like, this is joyful, and then I go, no, it's not. Yes, it is. <laughs> no. So I had to come to decisions that I was just going to state it, and then say, thank you. So you're looking at your ice cream cone, this is joyful. Well, I could really relate to good food. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Don't question your statement. Always come from a place of positive intention. So I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this. And finally, they come to me and they say, okay, we need a commitment. And I said, I don't want to be weird. <laughs> as weird as I am right now, I can still say, this is not my doing. Somebody else is doing this. I'm just the puppet. And they said, you can't be the puppet. You must walk it. Now, are you in or out? We need a commitment. And I'm in the bathtub. And I said, I don't want to be weird. I don't want to give up Shelly. And Shelly's this silly noof. You know, I got this sense of humor, and I swear sometimes, and occasionally I have a few drinks, and I do things I probably shouldn't do. And they said, we don't care what you choose to do in your humanity. You have come here to experience earthly human form. Do whatever. There's three rules. The first one is do no harm. Do no harm to anyone, most of all to yourself. They were really expressing the fact that you must love yourself the most. For in learning to love yourself and understand who you are, you see yourself in the faces of all those people you meet. For to know who you are 
is to know who every other human is as you meet them. <clears throat> and even though you don't like what the human's doing, you can acknowledge, I love you, and then say, stand way over there. <laughs> I don't like your vibratory field. I don't like what your human's doing, but once you pick it up, you can come over and stand here. So the first one was, do no harm. The second one was, find your joy and give grat. Oh, gosh, I'm in the wrong story. <laughs> The second one was, do all that you do with honesty and integrity. The honesty and integrity will lift you and it will facilitate your communication with others. Always be honest with integrity. And say to people that you love, let's make a deal with each other. That if we love each other, then I would not do anything to you on purpose. Therefore, when I do things you don't like and when we do things that we're not agreeing on, it's not because of my love. For you, it's because of my history and my background and the way my wounded child re reacts when I'm having a moment with somebody else. Because confrontation drives that. So first acknowledge that love is there and then know we have to practice. So when you and I are having an exchange and I've said something that's pissed you off, you say, hey listen, that hurt me. Let's practice. Because the first thing you admit is, yes, that hurt me, but you don't say you are this and you are that. So with the honesty and integrity, we will build rich, alive communication with those people that we loved, and it would deepen our relationships, lifting our field. So do no harm, do all you do with honesty and integrity. And the third one was, oh, I forgot. where's my husband? <laughs> Isn't that something? How can you say something so many times and then forget? Oh, find your earthly joy and give gratitude. Find, find whatever you decide to do. Do not judge what your earthly joy is. If right now, the things you're doing that are bringing you joy, you're going in your head, I'm not sure I should be doing this. As you practice the things that I'm talking about, those things will fall away. The things that are not serving you will fall away. But don't try to jump into, I've got to be this and this and this and this and this. Find your earthly joy, whatever that is. They gave me an example. This guy, Joe, comes home from his, uh, his job. He's a construction worker. He sits in his easy chair and kicks up his feet with his can of beer, watching a ball game. And Joe goes, this is living. That's his earthly joy right here and right now. We are not in a position to judge Joe, Joe's joy. <laughs> judge Joe. Okay. <laughs> so jo his joy is his can of beer and his ball game. If he says, thank you for the earthly experiences, he raises his field. And after a while, after a while, Joe is going to realize that's not such a joyful moment. That I'm going to leave that aside. I'm going to try this. But that comes from accepting everybody where they live today. Acceptance is the key to us uniting. They said we must unite in our similarities and not disintegrate by our differences. So now I've got all this stuff. And they said, okay, here's the deal. You're going to fire the earth grid. You knew I was going to get to this, right? Finally. <laughs> you're going to fire the earth grid. And what's going to happen is the energy you're trying to boost with these little, these little walkings and practicings is raining down. It's like a gamma ray, ray, radiated rain of positive energy coming from source. And it was intended this way. And we can, abs we can accept it and absorb it on that day. So we open ourselves during the hour that they gave us and we find our joy. Now they said, if you meditate and pray, meditate and pray, but do not do it from a place of guilt or shame. So if you're praying because, oh, I always prayed my whole life, but I always hate it. Don't pray. That's not, your, that's not a good one. It must come from a place of joy. When you meditate, if you go, oh, I always feel so corny doing this, I don't, you know, I don't like, don't meditate. Only if it comes from a place of joy. As you meditate and pray, if you choose one of those, play the music so your soul has something to ascend to. It's listening, the vibratory field is there, and you're lifting it. The third one was what Joe did. Find your earthly joy. So for the hour, it's 4.11 in the morning here. Make love. That's my favorite one. <laughs> Spend time with the person you love. Share your energy, and then say thank you. Or pull your babies into bed with you and read books. Spend the time doing something with them. Look at their little faces. There's joy in all of those things, even if you don't feel it every day. Say thank you, and you lift your field. The fourth one was, and the secret did a wonderful job paving the path for this, was the power of intention. Humanity 
has challenges. And these beings said, we know and understand the limitations of your humanity. So if you can't get up, if you're not even sure you believe this stuff, but the fissure of possibility exists, write yourself a note. Dear soul, <laughs> dear essence that lives inside of me, my God force, whatever you want to call it, a rose is a rose by any other name. I acknowledge you're in there, and I give permission, because the, the soul and the human must acknowledge each other, and the human must give permission. I know you're in there. I intend to connect with the grid on this day. Here's my joy. I intend to facilitate the lifting of my own being, to raise my own vibratory field, and to facilitate Earth's catalyst towards healing. And you notice that the catalyst, the same way I drove in the lake, was a catalyst to me walking this path. And you notice, for four years, I didn't snap up one day and go, whoo, I'm, I'm spiritual. I had to put myself in it. I had to walk the walk, as we do. Humanity must put something of themselves into what they're doing. So the catalyst of this healing is a catalyst. Time is passing. 2012 is a birth date. Everybody's talking about 2012. They told me it was a birth date. And as we birth the new time, as we birth the new humanity, whatever energy field we have established as the primary dominant field is the way we will move on that time. And once again, I wouldn't expect to be floating around on 2005. Humanity is going to evolve as it always has evolved. But we're going to have this boost and this lift. And on 2007, July 17th, when the field comes up into your chest for the hour, it's going to choke off. And they explained to me that they could see us then. We would see each other because we were going to kind of encode ourselves as, hey, I know you. We're in the same kind of boat here. We're doing the same work. And the third thing was it would lift permanently because it would kind of choke off. So instead of the human field running up and down like this, trying to level itself out, it would live up and down here. And as we live up and down in this space, we become self-policing. We don't need anybody to tell us what to do, because when we do crappy things, our field drops down here and we know it. We immediately feel yucky. Then it becomes, don't beat yourself up. Walk your path with diligence. Be kind to yourself and say, next time I'm going to make a different choice. And that choice may take five or six times before you're kindly noticing, oh, I've done it right this time. Now I feel that. So you must be kind to yourself as you travel this path. The beings came to me again about uh, March. Now I'm walking the path. I'm a whole being. They asked me to take this tattoo. They said it was a tribal marking for a return to wholeness. We are returning to one tribe mentality. We bring in the food and we share the food. That's one tribe mentality. We share the earth. We care for each other because we are tribe mates. We are brothers. And like I said, once you know who you are, I know who everybody else is. They asked me to wear a crystal in my heart chakra because it would radiate out my truth. As I spoke, it would send it out into the room and people would feel it. And they asked me to change my name to my star name or my tribal name, which was Samoya. So I had a huge ceremony. I did everything they asked and the world blossomed. I got invited everywhere. Everywhere, things were just coming around, newspaper articles and magazine articles, and travel, which they said I was, I was going to do, and I said, uh-uh. And here I am in D.C. So anyway, they said, we need you to do another project for us. And I said, okay, what is it? Because now I'm not fighting. What is it? What do I have to do? They said, we're going to send you ten songs. We're going to ask you to send them to Bradfield. Bradfield already has the beginning and the end in his heart. Tell them to compile those songs and play them during the hour that you meditate or pray. I said, okay. So three o'clock in the morning, I'd hear music, and I'd rush out thinking the kids were up, and I'd say, what's going on? Nobody there, and then I'd hear number two. In the middle of the afternoon, I'd hear music, and I'd, number four. So over four weeks, I had 10 songs in, with order. I sent them to Bradfield, he compiles the music, and he says to me, you know, I had the beginning and the end in my heart. Really? <laughs> Within three days, he made an album. Now, we don't have any of that album because we're sold out, and that's a wondrous joy. But you can get them on the website. It's called Light and Love. This music is a facilitation to the alignment of your chakra system, all 13 of them, not seven. There's 13 because your <coughs> highest self 
is up at the top. And what they talked about was the tonal resonance of healing. And they're telling me that each one of these systems are on a tonal vibration level. And I meet this man at a, uh, Neil Donald Walsh invited me to speak in Atlanta. And when I was there, I met a tribal man named Lou Thunder. And I'm telling him all I told you. And he said, oh, we practice that all the time, resonating the 13 tones. I said, really? He said, yeah, we go, ah, yeah. And they, they bounce the tones up and down. And as they do, they bounce their feet into the earth because the tonal resonance goes down through their legs and into the earth to heal the earth. And they've been doing it for all time. So this was a validation. I was like, cool. So this music was to be played during the hour because it would facilitate a better lift, a higher lift, a more easy lift. It would align these chakras. The tonal resonance would have a healing and there would be an ascension that would be easier. So Bradfield sends me the CD and says, here's a CD. Okay, I put it on and I get in the bathtub because I know there must be something else. And in the bathtub, listening to the music comes part two of Fire the Grid. Two stones and a capstone called Project Cause. And this is wonderful because when we get seven or eight million people in the heart zone of self-policing and understanding our own power, when Project Cause comes forward, we have seven or eight million people saying, yes, this is possible. Because once we understand the I, the we we need to make these changes are just going to fall in place. Project Cause is a funneling project. Now, there's a whole bunch of rules and regulations, and I certainly won't get into them right now because it's huge, and I haven't even started to figure out how I'm going to organize it. But the basis is, right now we have 10,000 projects. This guy over here is trying to help these people, and this people is trying to help these people. And we have all these mini projects with small budgets trying to help individually. United, we stand. What they want us to do is very simple. Take all of the small earth projects and funnel them into one global project called Project Cause. There's a global council to oversee the money. And they've told me how to put it all together. And once we have all the money being funneled down the right way, and we get the people and we funnel them in the right way, within two to three years of curbing our own spending and funneling the money, we can rebuild the foundation of earth according to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That is, clean water and food, shelter, septic, and clean air for every living baby on this planet. Every earthly community that is in need, no, no longer need to be in need. Because this global project is going to do kind of a blanket. We've got two to three years to blanket everybody and make sure that the first step of Maslow's is put in place. Once the first place the first pyramid of Maslow's is put in place, then real good stuff starts to happen. Because we have a billion indigos walking behind us. A billion indigos. And we still have to live in this world of material and grass and doing work and politics. And these billion indigos are going to step up the plate and they're going to go, we don't like you, and we don't like you, and we don't like you. Oh, here's our candidate. Oh, and doesn't democracy win in this country? We're a billion strong, and our vote is not for any of these people. Our vote is for this person. They're the ones. They're the ones that are going to make the major changes. We have to lead by example. We have to show them a different choice set. You don't have to go for the corporate me, 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 money, money, money. That doesn't make you happy. That doesn't give you anything. Even with the secret, oh, buy a car or get a car or get a boyfriend. First thing you've got to do is get a life. <laughs> the first thing we've got to do is heal what we got. The cars and the joy and all those things will follow, but it cannot follow. We can no longer put band-aids on our brain regarding these children that are in third world countries with no clean water and no food. How can you get your new Lexus and drive around in it happy with your children and your grandchildren when there's a child somewhere else who gets garbage? out of a can and a glass of muddy water. Oh, forget the glass, you've got to put your face in the muddy water. How can we do that? The first thing we have to tend to is the foundation of our planet. They said to me to tell you, if you all had a house, everybody can relate to owning a house, the foundation of your house is crumbling. The bricks are falling out and the mortar is falling apart. Do you buy $500 worth of wallpaper and wallpaper a room? Anybody do that? No. 
we start tending to the foundation. And every time we get a bit more money, we build a bit stronger foundation. And finally, when the house is structurally sound, we attend to beautification and to the things we want in our house. That's what Project Cause is all about. If we get a billion people and the other five billion aren't there, that's OK. We're going to build a world within a world. And we're going to do it because there's enough of us to make it happen. Now, when I was doing my commitment ceremony in the bathtub and saying, yeah, I'm here, I'd like to share this piece with you. They said to me, do you want to see how much a piece of source energy you are? The light of grace, God, whatever words you use. And I said, yes, I do. And the same way they took me out of my body and went up into the sky during the accident, they took me out and I went out into that space. And I went out and out and out so far, I wondered if I was outside or inside. I really wondered. And as I got out there, I saw planets and stars, so I decided it was outer space. And in amongst outer space was this magnificent pink plasma, and it was iridescent and sparkly. And there was little of things of electricity running through it. And they said, this is your source energy. And it was everywhere. And they said, this source energy is a stem cell pool for you to manifest what you need. Be careful what you ask for. Then they said, here is how much a piece of it you are. And they reached into the pink uh, plasma, and the hand that reached in pulled it, and 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 put it in somebody's head. But the thread didn't break. And then they reached in and grabbed another piece, and pulled it, and pulled it, and pulled it, and put it in the head of somebody else. And the thread didn't break. They said, do you see? You are a piece of divine source. You are like the hand of the arm of God. It is a symbiotic relationship. No need for reverence. It needs for care and respect for self. Then you can have care and respect for all over all others. And then they pulled back so that I could see the earth, and there were six billion pink threads running out to this stem cell pool. And they said, this is your source. Unite by your similarities. If somebody calls it God and somebody else calls it source, it doesn't matter. A word is just a word. A rose is a rose by any other word, or by any other name. And then they said, when somebody says, I pray like this, and somebody else says, I pray like this, and my God is Buddha, or my, they said, it does not matter. Be interested and say, fascinating, wow, tell me about that. Tell me about what you do. That's cool, because every time we ask somebody about what they do, there's something in it for us. There's some kind of knowledge, or some piece of something that will elevate us, not to judgment, but to fascination. We are fascinating. And as we find each other fascinating, whether we got pink hair or we're tattooed or we're, we're uh, perished or all the things that people say, oh, that's bad or that's negative, those indigo children are tattooing and perishing their bodies because they're returning to their ancient tribal ideas. That's why they're doing it. Speak to them. They are fascinating. And they will tell you wonderful things. And you just have to find them fascinating especially little tiny ones. We have to ask, ask them, what are you doing? What do you think? Who are you? Tell me about you. And when they tell us really far out things, we go, wow, that's cool. So do not put down the ideas of these youth, because embedded in them is the ideas that are going to create the new world. And it is our job as adults to facilitate their confidence. So when Project Cause comes forward and we start walking the path, these kids are going to go, we like the way these adults are living. We choose this path, not that path. <sighs> um, I guess that's it. <laughs> I always say that um, that's all I have to say, and then people ask me questions, and I realize I have a mouthful to say about something else. <laughs> so I guess the next step is to uh, ask you if there's something you'd like me to say more about or extrapolate on or if there's something you'd like to share um, then we can have a little bit of time to discuss any other issues. Yes? First of all, thank you. It was oh, thank you. really great to hear you speak. Um, I, just, I just wanted you to elaborate a little bit on the grid. So on um, se uh, July 17th at 4.11 in Vancouver when we do, when we send up this, this intention for planetary healing, <coughs> Um, what would what would the symbolic or visible difference, if you could see it, what would it look like after that? After that day? Yeah. Well, the same way 
I said, we all have to accept where we live with our joy. We also live at our vibratory field of experience. A 25-year veteran monk is up here, and I mean, he may very well feel a great deal of difference in the shift. And somebody who's like Joe is just stepping into his program, he might go, ooh, nothing really happened. But over the coming weeks and months, he may feel different. And that's where we all become teachers of teachers. Because if Joe comes to your house going, you're into that crystal kind of stuff, aren't you? <laughs> because then we're going to be guidance for people who are kind of just waking up. So you may feel something, and you may feel the shift, and that's fully where you live with it. I have a sneaking suspicion there may be all sorts of incredible events happen. And what we're going to do on the website is put it up saying, did you fire the grid? And then let people come with their, uh, we're going to start building a database because Project, <coughs> Project Cause is going to start with this database. And as the database comes in, we're going to give you a space to say something you might have experienced or something that incredible happened to you. But I can't tell you what it's going to be because it's going to be different for every person. And what would the, the actual grid look like? Okay, what I saw was our auric fields attached <laughs> to the grid field. And we get a hexagon. And they said... Every human gets a hexagon. Even the richest man can't buy two. You get one. And it's almost a binary system. It's on or it's off. And what we're looking to do is raise our field. And when we raise our field and fire our own grid, that hexagon will light up. And when it's lit up, it's on. And those that haven't lit up their field, the faith of one person firing their hexagon will radiate out a thousand. So it's going to boost anybody who's in that field and give them a little boost. Um, our orgasm, our human orgasm, was intended as a grid firer for your own field. That's what it was intended for. It was supposed to be our ability to reach an electrical current so high that we went and we fired our own auric field, and it regenerated the field so we could have another couple of days of, whew, okay, I know what I'm doing. So they talked about the sins of the flesh, and they said, everything that we've given you, not we, but the grace of God, has given you all the joys of the flesh. Humanity has distorted. Mm -hmm. They are not sins of the flesh. They are gifts you were given to facilitate the hardest journey a soul can take. You guys are in graduate classes, but you're only in kindergarten because the veil is there. You're doing grade 13 calculus as you're in kindergarten because you're walking a path that's very difficult. Orgasm was intended to fire your field and assist as you lift your field. Sight, sound, touch, kissing, touching skin, all those things were pleasures to facilitate a very difficult journey. See, I do go on. <laughs> is there somebody else? Yes? What can you say about 2012? What they told me about 2012 was that it was the end of a 26,000 cycle of Earth through an orbit. And as it came full circle to the 26,000 year, we were about to go into another 26,000 rotation. And what they said was this was the first time humanity was given a conscious choice to direct which way they went. So what we're actually having when we fire the grid and raise our fields over the next five years is a vote. I vote for a field energy of 800. So fire the grid day is only one day. There's another day coming in July, July 28, 2009, and there's going to be another opportunity. And within that two-year period, more and more and more people will be more and more and more awake. So as 2012 comes up, between November 2011 and, November, and December 2012, it is the birth date. The same as every birth of a baby has a gestation period, which was the first period of time. Now we're in the birth date of time between 2011 and 2012. So the energy shift will happen within that time zone. And whatever energy field we are able to maintain as the baby is born, as we're born, um, will assist, no, will direct the way we choose to consciously vote to go with our energy field. I didn't understand what was happening, but they kept talking to me about birthing children, and I didn't know what that meant. And they were telling me that when a baby is born into the world, it's not a human being. It's a soul. It doesn't know it's a human being. It comes into the earth, 
And it needs to be told, it's okay, you're safe, we're here, we love you. There's many joys on this planet that needs an energy field in a room of people who are welcoming the soul in. Come, little one, we love you, come. And so what they started to tell me was, as the baby's born, whether it's in a hospital or a home birth or any of those things, we need to put people in the room as grounded centaurs, saying, we're here, we're guarding you, we're protecting you, we love you, welcome, welcome. Because then the soul would feel that, because it only knows vibratory fields. And I couldn't understand, I said, why am I having a baby? Why are you talking about this? And they talked about it for a long time. And finally they said, you, as a planet, are about to give birth, collectively. And you must make sure that the field of energy that you birth it into is what we have described. Welcome, welcome, full of joy and optimism. That's what they want us to do for the end of 2012. Yes, sir. Well, two questions. One is, uh, you spoke about these angelic influences. Would you acknowledge, say, demonic? Yeah, and I wouldn't call them demonic, and I don't call them angelic. When these beings came to me, I said, why do I see you like I see you? Because what they look like is, if you, would, if you, you ever see that toy you push your hand into, and on the other side, the fingerprint comes out? It's like pins, and you push your hand. Anyway, if you had a million pins of light and pushed your face into it, on the other side would be kind of a, um, um, a relief of what you look like. And the, this pin system is made of liquid light. And they push their face into it, and I can see them. They said, we will come to each human as individually as we need to. If you're a Christian-based individual, and you believe in the Virgin Mary, and you believe in all the angels, that's what's going to come on your deathbed or in your near-death experience. My son saw angels, and God held him for three days. But I didn't see angels. Now, I have met an angel. His name's Gabriel, and he's magnificent. But... That angelic force that you speak about is very real. But they said the God source or the energy source does not create negative energy. It does not know how. The demonic force that you're talking about is our doing. And it has manifested from our hate and loathing and has manifested into a life of its own on our planet. And I have had several encounters with that. And I had to really learn. Of course, I learned the hard way because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. But I learned the hard way that the light makes that go away. The ohm sound makes that go away. And when I get into the chanting of, I am the light of the light, and you are not allowed to be here, and I truly believed it, that was gone. But the first time I was encountered in that, and I said, I am the light of the light, and you're not allowed to be here, it laughed at me. And it said, you don't believe your own stuff. So that's what they were explained to me about the different energy forces of the world. I'm sure there's more to it, but that's kind of my synaptic. Well, uh, and the second question is, how do you measure your progress? Like, like we, if we get a police state or totalitarian whatnot here in Canada, who knows? Uh, that doesn't sound like progress. I mean, how, how would you look at the, the macro political picture two, three years hence and say, we're on the right track. Well, they said we would become self-policing. They said once you live in the heart zone and the vibration of love at like 800 megahertz, we don't need to be told how to be good people. The Bible was a rule book. It was the first rule book put here because people were thinking, oh man, how are we ever going to control human beings? We have to make them fear. Fear what's happening. And if the Bible had come from a place of love, and this, of course, goes off into a whole new range, but what they said to me was, one of the very first words that was changed in the Bible that affected who we were was the word for God. In Aramaic, the word for God is not Father. It is Daddy. And the, and the people who wrote the book and transferred and did this and did that, and the book just got kept being passed around, they said, how are we ever going to get human beings to do what we tell them to do if they think they're talking to daddy. <laughs> Daddies are full of joy and love. Daddies are full of acceptance. Whereas fathers are reverence and stern and punishment. So the thing was, they didn't trust that we would ever do the right thing from the place of love. That we had to be ruled from a place of fear in order to make us to do the right thing. 
Anybody else? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Oh, somebody here? Following with some interest, Tom Kenyon's work with the Creatrix and the work that he's hoping to do on um, July 8th. Are you aware of this work? Um, since I've gotten in uh, British Columbia, people have been telling me about that work. But I don't remember. I said I don't read or follow other people's ideas at this point. So uh, the Hathors have not been a part of your reality. I don't know what a Hathor is. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. Yes. I take it that the date of the last time the saints came to you as a guidance. Yes, yeah. they okay. sent it to me by a tipper page. You know, you know at the bottom of your TV screen when the Dow Jones comes across? Mm -hmm. The Dow Jones ticker tape came around my head like this. This was in the early stages before I was listening well. And it would go January, February, March, April, May. And then went July, July, July. And I went, oh, July. And I went, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> and then as it came around, I got the date. And I had the time and that information. That's how I got that. OK, because uh, after I was on the website, I didn't know about the card, but I just read a little piece about your, your new death experience. And so. Anyway, I went to your website on uh, July 17th. Immediately, I went to check out the day. And uh, one of the um, amazing things about this year that three times, Pluto, which is to do the will, is conjunct with the galactic center. Mm -hmm. And one of those days is July 17th. Yeah. Now Pluto can be is blood of will, and it could either be will for good or the will for. Well, the American Astrology Association contacted me yeah. early in the beginning and said, "Where did you get this date?" Yeah. And I said, "Well, these beans gave me the date," and I was very reluctant to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, they said this date is perfect. If you had spent your whole life with an astrology chart, looking, looking, looking you probably would never have come up with a perfect date. But the date is perfect. And I said, well, then thank you. They must know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sure that most people that follow the, uh, the whole Fire the Grid uh, program uh, will be more than capable of keeping their vibration at about 800 or plus. Uh, was there any insight given by these beings as to what would happen if um, will we be able to maintain our level at 800 plus as we move forward, even if the rest of the world wasn't catching up? What they said was it would pinch itself off, and instead of falling this low and rising up, which is harder to get up, it would stay up here. And the other thing they said was we would become beacons of light. And because our radiated energy field was so high, people we encountered were going to feel uh, joyful type energy, and they may ask you, you, you seem different, what are you doing? And this is a tried and true moment for me because I was such a miserable human being. Mm -hmm. I really was. If I walked into a room full of people, I didn't want to hug them, I didn't want anything to do with them, and it showed. People treated me like that. And now the most miraculous thing happens is when I meet people, they immediately come up and they're very <coughs> open. And that's what this field is going to do. It's going to keep you open and you're going to share it and people are hopefully are going to catch it but it won't fall down here anymore. Okay, it's the distinction between that being at a personal level versus a global level. Right, because we have to take care of the I. In taking care of the I and making ourselves fundamentally the most important person in the world, that's not selfish and greedy and full of me, me, me. Me, me, me is much different than I am, I can, I choose, I will, I am. So regardless of which way the, the boat goes, uh, our mission is, or our purpose is basically to be as high as we can and just do what we're here for. Right, and detach yourself from the outcome. Totally. Once you detach yourself from the outcome, you are walking the walk, leading by example. Now I will share a little thing with you that will make you happy. <laughs> My four-year-old son comes out of this near-death drowning experience and he comes home and mommy doesn't want to be weird. And my son's walking around my house talking about God. God this, God that, and I went, what do you know about God? And he said, Duh. <laughs> God held me for three days while I was in a coma. I said, oh, wow. And then he told me that God had an army of angels and that coming out of their chest were rainbow lights of love. And then he said, there's also a darker group. And he said, they don't have rainbow lights, but they're still God's angels, but they're dark and they don't like the energy of light. And I said, oh, and he said, they're having a war for our planet. But don't worry, God's going to win. <laughs> Just like that. I mean, with absolute conviction. 
And he started drawing these spirally circles. And I said, what are you drawing? What is that? He said, that's a vortex. I said, really? What's a vortex? And he said, it's a portal that God uses to jump between dimensions. <laughs> no. And he was four. And of course, we had no God in our house. I used to say the only time I heard God was when I was swearing. <laughs> so when I started my path of faith, I had to go back to the things he said. Because that's really all the tangible stuff I had, plus the miracle of me coming back to life. So apparently, according to my four-year-old son, who's now nine, and uh, we have pictures of some stuff, um, God's going to win. So detach yourself from the outcome, do your best, walk your walk, and lead by example. Yes, sir. No. Um, thinking globally to add to what he's saying, uh, I have a question for my friend Mary and also for myself, is how many countries are you commu in communication with? And I'm the one who wants to translate the website into Arabic, Persian, and Hebrew in time. Ah, ah, we in New York, yeah. 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 It's okay, go ahead. Great people, no budget, 87 countries. <laughs> Woo! Think about it. 87 countries. So we have that, G8. We have 7, 8 million people, maybe more, because we have lost count. Maureen Moss of the World Puja Network has 5 million people on her team. Neil Donald Walsh, who's a part of this, has millions of people on his team. And I have 1,600 teams of my own. Yo. Now, our own, because this is a, a project of our, not I. So we have 1,600 teams. Some of them are 6,000 people throughout the country. So there's lots and lots of people involved in this. And like I said, three people with no budget <coughs> made this happen. So when Project Cost steps up to the gate here and I say, guess what, guys? Now we can get a budget, and now we can use money, and now we can do all this stuff. Yeah. And imagine what three million of us can do. Have you got anybody in Jerusalem? I think there is somebody in Jerusalem. But I see, I haven't kept track of that stuff. That's my young site. Annie who does email that stuff. Okay. Just email the site, and they'll, they can ask them. Yeah. Thank you. We'll talk after. Yes. Do you have any information on future modes of travel? No. <laughs> I have some information on the indigos. They said that these children were born here already vibrating. That's why we have 40 million children on Ritalin. <laughs> now, somebody like me knows the difference because I lived without vibrating and then I lived with vibrating so I can tangibly tell somebody what I'm going through. These kids were born 800 megahertz. They came in vibrating. The thing that we can do to assist these children to the shift happens is touch their bodies. They need a lot of massage therapy. They need a lot of hand-to-hand -hand contact because the energy will, we will suck up some of it for them and release some of their torment. The other thing that they need is in-water therapy. Water acts as a conduit that pulls the energy away. The same way we can pull it away from them, the water pulls it away from them. And the third thing that, that we can do with these kids right now is play this kind of music. Great music that lifts the field because the kids will feel the vibratory essence in their field and will feel more relaxed. The thing is, as we move into the center of the Milky Way galaxy, our physical field is changing, not within our bodies, but within our world. What's going to happen is when we reach 800 megahertz, because we're, we've moved into that galactic place, these kids are going to go, whoo, thank goodness. But what do you think about the people who are at 300? They're going to feel miserable. And they said there may appear to be some sort of pandemic or a sickness. Because what's going to happen is a vibratory of 300 in a field of 800 makes you feel sick. So it's, it's a, everybody's benefit to find, try to find a way to raise their field. So what I always say is offer fissures of possibility and plant seeds. What do you got to lose? That's what I always say. What do you got to lose? I'm not asking you to sign up for the million dollar project and you know give away your rights and become a cult member. I'm just saying find your own personal joy, experience it and say thank you.
的。